Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Thanks, Rhett, for that reading. Lee, for leading us in our songs of praise this morning. Stephen, brother, thank you for those thoughts before our, our communion together. To Rob and Lydia for those ministry minutes that you're putting together. And to those women who work in sharing good news uh, with, with women who are in prison right now, encouraging them, uh, encouraging their hearts, leading them closer to Jesus. We thank you for that faithful work that you do. Uh, David and Kara Pepperling and son Austin have indicated their desire to become a part of our church family here, and we're very excited about that. If you guys would stand for just a second, David and Kara, right back here. I guess Austin's in the nursery. Uh, it's great, great to have you with us. Kara is the daughter of Doyle and Janet Kelly, so it's great to have more members of, of that family here. Uh, David has just been accepted into the Tulsa Police Academy. Kara teaches elementary school in, in Sepulpa, and uh, if you haven't met them yet, please do so as soon as possible. Blaise Cronister, would you stand also, please? Where's Blaise? Right back here. Thank you, Blaise, for standing. Uh, no relation to Leith or Leslie Cronister, I don't believe, but um, Leith, it's great to have you here, and uh, he's going to school, working here in the area, and I know your brother and sister-in-law are, are great to, grateful to have you here, as are we, so thanks, brother. Life groups meet today. Thanks for welcoming them uh, so, so warmly. Life groups are meeting today, and check that insert in your bulletin for where those groups are meeting. If you haven't been one to yet, just been one yet to one yet, just find out uh, when and where they're meeting. You are welcome to join them. Follow any instructions are on there about meals. Maybe that they're brown bagging it, so just pick up something and, and join that group. We'll be uh, picking up the, the pace just a little bit today. Um, I appreciate Robert and Robert so much. I had some computer problems Friday, fired up the laptop, which I depend on both here and at home. I take it back and forth, fired it up Friday morning. Black screen on my laptop. I could barely make something out. I knew it wasn't dead. I just knew the light wasn't on. So i um, been using an external monitor, which is just weird be working on a laptop and looking at an external monitor, but kind of got it to them through a back door, so I appreciate them doing that this morning. Poetry is, is something that is extremely powerful, just poetic verse itself. Maybe there are works of poetry that you committed to memory as a child that, that have stuck with you. Maybe there are favorite poets that you've had, either English poets or American poets. Uh, maybe you're a fan of Robert Burns or Robert Frost, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Maybe you're into the iambic pentameter of William Shakespeare and his sonnets and his plays. Uh, maybe you're a fan of somebody like Rudyard Kipling or a more modern day poet like Weird Al Yankovic. Um, somebody's a Weird Al fan. I'm normally at the office by 8.30, try to be here by 8.30 in the mornings after dropping Coleman off at Oasis, but sometimes I'm running, running a little behind and I'm still in the car at around 9 o'clock uh, when the Writer's Almanac comes on in PR with Garrison Keillor. And he always closes out with a poem, and sometimes those really resonate with me. Sometimes they don't, but sometimes they really resonate with me. And poetry is a very powerful thing. Music is very moving, even without lyrics. Just music in and of itself uh, can evoke incredible emotions, the melodies and or the harmonies, the note and chord progressions or changes. Sometimes certain melodies are just haunting and can move us, and I've found that to be the case uh, in my life. Gabriel's oboe from the film The Mission uh, normally start tearing up about the third or fourth note. That, that music just does that to me. Many of you know that I'm a, a fan of Mark Knopfler. He's one of my guitar heroes, not just from his Dire Straits days and the solo work that he's done, but from the musical scores that he's done.
for motion pictures, never seen this film, probably never will see this film, but track four on this soundtrack, A Love Idea, is something that it, it's just beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful violin. Uh, Kim loves it, Coleman loves it. He selects that out of about six CDs in the changer in, in the Acadia, and he'll go to track four, and uh, he will play that one. Ashiken Farewell that was featured as the, the title song in Ken Burns' Civil War series. Again, something that, that it's written, I think it's written as uh, a Scottish lament. It, it's a waltz in D major. Starts out with just violin, little guitar, uh, and bass join in later. But because of its connection with the moving stories that were related by Burns in that documentary series, again, I, I start tearing up very, very soon when I hear that. Uh, very simple tune here. Uh, I don't know music. I'm told that there are three notes, E, C, and G. The G uh, notes uh, an octave apart, but just three notes. And yet the playing of those three notes really, really moves people, depending on the circumstances, depending on the setting. And when you combine the power of poetry with the majesty of music, you get the power of song. There are actually lyrics to Taps. Uh, it was composed by Brigadier General Daniel Butterfield. In fact, Taps is also known as Butterfield's Lullaby, or Day is Done, based on the first phrase. And this is just the first verse. Day is done, dawn the sun, from the lakes, from the hills, from the sky, all is well, safely rest, God is nigh. And then the second and third verses, fading light dims the sight, and a star gems the sky, gleaming bright. From afar, drawing near, falls the night. Thanks and praise for our days, meet the sun, meet the stars, meet the sky. As we go, this we know, God is not. And while the music is moving and, and the words are beautiful, you put the words with the music and it just takes on more meaning. So the power of poetry combined with the majesty of music gets us the power of song. That's why you can sometimes read the lyrics of songs. Uh, I remember back in high school days waiting on the next issue of Hit Parader to come out so that you could flip to the back and read the lyrics to the songs that you couldn't make all the lyrics out in on the radio and normally had a lot wrong. So you would go to the back of Hit Parader, read the lyrics, and you know suddenly you would know what they were actually saying and not what you thought they said. But just reading the lyrics can sometimes still leave us a bit cold. But you hear those words being sung and it can move us greatly. Uh, songs permeate and punctuate our lives literally from the cradle to the grave beginning with the, the lullabies that our mothers sang to us or played for us to the songs that will be sung at our memorial service or at our funeral. And in the same way, song has been a part of the history of God's people throughout. The, the, the playlist in Scripture starts at Exodus 15 and goes to Revelation 15. It's just an easy way to remember it. Almost the first book of the Old Testament, last book of the New Testament. The first song we read about, you read about instruments uh, being made and, and music sort of being created and invented early in the book of Genesis. Song doesn't come along until Exodus 15 continues to Revelation 15. And Exodus 15 is the song of Moses, and amazingly, in Revelation 15 is the song of Moses. I don't know if it was the original composition or a remix or, or what it is. It's a long time from Exodus 15 to, to Revelation 15, and it's sort of mashed up with this other song, the song of the Lamb. And so the song of Moses starts, Exodus 15, ends up in Revelation 15. The situation in Exodus 15 is that God has just delivered in this incredibly amazing and powerful and miraculous way his people from 400 years of Egyptian bondage and slavery. And you don't need me to remind you of the story of the parting of the waters, the safe uh, passage of the Israelites through those walls of water on dry ground, the waters going back in their place, drowning uh, the Israelite army, 600 of, of Pharaoh's chariots. Exodus 15.1 says, Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And then the rest of the chapter tells us the lyrics of the song. 
And the beginning of the song goes, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. The song of deliverance continues. And in Revelation 15, the song of Moses is a song of deliverance, and the song of the Lamb is a song of deliverance. Deliverance from sin, deliverance from oppression, deliverance from tribulation and persecution. So songs of deliverance are very important in the history of God's people. And then in verse 20, the ladies join in. Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. And it seems to be sequential, but maybe they overlapped a little bit, and I just can't help but get this picture out of my mind of sort of the women being the backup singers with tambourines uh, while, the, while the men are sort of leading the, the main part of the song, because the song is the same. Verse 21, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, the horse and his rider he is hurled into the sea. And so this is either antiphonal and sort of back and forth, or they're singing at the same time. You fast forward in the playlist to Judges 5, 250 years later, and God is once again, as he is so given to do, he has delivered his people because of their cries. This time a, a Canaanite king named, named Jabin, Sisera is his five-star general, and through Deborah and Barak and a woman named Jael, who gave Sisera a splitting headache, a lethal splitting headache, for those of you who know that, that story, uh, God delivers them. And Judges 5.1, then Deborah and Barak, the son of Ahinoam, sang on that day. Probably nominated as best performance by a duet uh, in Scripture. I don't know. I think it may be the only duet that we read about in Scripture. But that particular song in Judges 5, there's this encouragement for other people to sing with them. Judges chapter 5, verse 3 and verse 10 and verse 12. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers, I to the Lord, I will sing. Verse 10, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, you who travel on the road, rich, poor, everyone, sing. Verse 12, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. 200 years further down the playlist, we get to David uh, in 2 Samuel 22. And 2 Samuel 22 is identical to Psalm 18. And so if you think, you know, if you're reading along and you think there's a similarity between those, there's more than a similarity. Those two chapters are identical. But... 2 Samuel 22, 1, David spoke the words of this song to the Lord in that day, in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hands of Saul. Again, a song of deliverance that goes, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. In that same time period, in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 7 through 11, tell us that on that day David first assigned Asaph, and Asaph is going to be credited with 12 of the psalms that are in our collection of psalms in the Old Testament. David's going to be self uh, credited with about 72, 73 of those. 2 Samuel 23, 1 calls David the sweet psalmist of Israel. Uh, he is their, their noted songwriter. But on that day, David first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. By my count, there were about 113 uses of that verb sing that I could find in, in Scripture. 84 of those, 75% of those either declarative statements of I will sing or imperative statements of sing to the Lord, 
75 percent of those are in the book of Psalms. Fast forward another 300 years to the time of, of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah and the official ordered the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with joy and bowed low and worshiped just as 3,000 years later, we're still singing the, the, the words, the songs of, of David. 300 years later, they were obviously still doing the same. 150 years later, the exiles returning from Babylon, rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. When the foundation is laid, um, Ezra 3.11 says, they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And the oldest people among them began to cry because they remembered the grandeur of the former temple. They could tell just by the foundation and the footprint of this thing that it wasn't going to be nearly as great. And so they began to cry. Other people are just overwhelmed with joy. And you can't distinguish the rejoicing from the cry. And the sound could be heard from very far away, the text tells us. Our singing together, as was the case for them, our singing together in our assemblies is the most participatory thing that we do when we come together on, on Sunday mornings. More of us sing than, than take the Lord's Supper. More of us sing than actively pray with the public leader. More of us sing than actively in our minds and hearts read along with the one who is reading scripture. More of us sing than contribute. More of us sing than are actively engaged in the listening of the sermon. Just take my word for that. Singing unifies our, our heads and our hearts. It ties together the, the whole of our being, our minds and our emotions and our memories. And so we have texts like 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Paul writes, I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the mind also. Songs transcend space and time because they have the ability to transport us beyond the present uh, to the recent past, to the distant past, to a different place in time. Uh, and that transportation can trigger emotions that don't exist in the present. But when that song transports you to that other place, suddenly you feel the emotions of that different time of place, often to the result that, that you're very greatly moved. And you can't forget the connection of that song with that time and place. And I could just go around this morning and get testimonies. I'm going to ask you to do that in your life groups today, to talk about songs that have special meaning to you because of connections that they have in your past, in, in your life. During the time that my parents were missionaries in Liberia, West Africa, when I was 10 and 11 years old, we didn't have a television, we didn't have a records player. Um, we had, my sister and I were both given radios before we went over there, and shortwave radios, and they could pick up Voice of America. Every Sunday night after I was supposed to be asleep, Voice of America would play uh, the U.S. Top 10. And I would, I would listen, I would put my radio under my pillow so I could hear it through the pillow, but my parents couldn't hear it out, outside the room. I don't think with earbuds there's no need to even try that anymore, but you try to be a little inventive when you're a kid. And we also had a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And so when VOA would, would play the, the top ten during the time when it was okay for me to be up, I would record on this little reel-to-reel -reel player um, th those songs from the radio. Not very good quality, but good enough. And every time I hear those songs, I remember I had that on a little reel-to-reel -reel in Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, Feeling Stronger Every Day by Chicago. Will It Go Round in Circles by Billy Preston. Smoke on the Water by Deep Purple. Those were all out in 73, 74. When I hear Barracuda, I think of the Pizza Hut in Lewisburg, Tennessee, where I heard that song on a jukebox for the first time. Skate Away by Knopfler and Dire Straits, heard in my bedroom in my parents' apartment in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Viva La Vida by, by Coldplay, I heard on the radio for the first time on one of the saddest days of my life in 2008. I'd never heard it before. It had been out for a while. I just hadn't heard it. Heard that song on one of the 
the saddest days of my life, and all I've got to hear are those strings at the beginning of that song, and the emotions come. And it's the same way with our songs of faith. Songs that we have sung this morning, songs that are in our book, songs that are in our paperless hymnal, songs that you learned at church camp, you will always associate with church camp. Songs that were sung at your baptism, or the baptism of your child, will always have that special meaning for you. Songs that may have been sung during your wedding, songs that were sung at the funeral of a loved one. Songs that you may have learned on a mission trip or may have learned with a, a campus ministry that you were involved in when you were in college. Songs that you guys, concert choir members, uh, have learned, are learning, and will continue to learn as a part of your being a part of this group. It will be impossible for you to not connect those songs with the experience that you're having right now. Maybe songs take you back to an earlier earlier decades of your life when you were a part of a young professionals group somewhere it may take you back to your former church home it may remind you of a particular worship leader under whose direction you learned that song every time i hear glorify thy name i think about dale and kent hartman and others at a, at a youth a retreat outside of sydney australia in the mid 80s about a month before i headed back to the states after two years over there first time I'd ever heard that song. Only about six people singing it. The most beautiful thing I'd, I'd ever heard. And I, I can't forget that. Uh, at the McDermott Road Church, where we were for nine years with Stephanie and her family and, and many others, it was a Christian college chorus from Faulkner University that, in a performance, sang Sweet Adoration. It was the first time I heard it. I cried the first time I heard it and nearly do every time since. I think about song, some of the songs um, I, I stand in awe, I sing praises. Those were songs I, I learned at, at McDermott Row. There were a bunch that I learned there, and I connect those songs with that place. I've learned a lot of new songs in the six years that we have been here, and I connect those songs with, with this place. Seems like the Israelites in, uh, or, or the, those from Judah in Babylonian captivity did the same thing because when they were asked to sing their home songs, songs of Jerusalem, songs of the temple, songs of, of the temple, they didn't know if they could do it because they were in a different place. Those songs belonged somewhere else, and, and how, how can we sing the Lord's song here? Matthew 26, 30, after sharing in that Passover meal and infusing new covenant meaning into the bread and the wine and Judas has gone out and Jesus has washed their feet and everything that transpires there. Before they go to Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, they sang a hymn. And I guarantee you, the 11 men in that room who sang that hymn with him never sang that hymn the same way again. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was one of the Psalms. I don't know if it was something connected with the Passover, but they would never forget when they sang that song with Jesus on the night of his betrayal and the evening before his crucifixion. Same thing with Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail at midnight. They were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. The prisoners were listening to them. Those hymns had to have taken on totally new meaning thereafter, both for them and for those who heard them, those prisoners, some of whom may have later become Christians, remembered the first time they heard those songs. It was sung by Paul, it was sung by Silas. So many of our songs are about Jesus, and, and understandably so. The early church didn't have any songs about Jesus. They had to write them. So just to encourage you, there is nothing more first century Christianity than writing new songs about Jesus one of the first things the early church had to do. They, they kept singing the psalms, but we need some songs about Jesus. And so they had to compose those songs. In the series of studies, Super September Ember Sunday nights that we did, those five Sunday nights that various ones of us taught classes, one of the classes, the, the class that I taught had to do with scripture and song and, and their ability to bring us peace. I, I talked about that rural congregation where I preached the last two and a half years that I was at Lipscomb and that once a month we would go to a local nursing home and, and have a service there at two o'clock and early on I began to 
to wonder whether we were really spending our time very well. Most of the people looked totally disengaged, various states of decline, some with dementia, some with Alzheimer's, and I, I felt very ashamed of myself for thinking that from a later perspective when I began to see that as familiar scriptures were read, and especially as old familiar hymns were sung, eyes that had seemed glazed over to that point just brightened, just lit up, and smiles came on faces, and faces that had not moved in the least, lips would begin to move. Uh, Charlotte Thrailkill's mother, Mary Steger, is part of our church family here. She's no longer able to, to attend, uh, at least not very often. She's 92 years old now. She resides at Cedar Ridge Assisted Living, and back before Christmas, Dave Larson, this is not something you are a man of many talents. Dave apparently not only plays the harmonica, but he's in a harmonica club. And uh, the harmonica club went there and, and they performed for them back before Christmas and gave harmonicas to each of the residents, including Mary, and worked with them in, in learning a song. And Charlotte shared a video with me on her phone the other night. And Mary didn't join in. She was a little sheepish about joining in right then. But after everyone left, she, she played the harmonica for Charlotte. She had played the harmonica as a child, as a young child. It probably not played the harmonica for 80 years. And she played Trust and Obey, just as clear and beautiful and recognizable as, as anything. Hadn't had that instrument to her lips, but it was there because of the power of poetry, the power of verse, the power of song. And we may run a, a few minutes later. I've got a three-minute video that, that I want to show you. Robert, if you could get that ready, queued up to, to play. I, I know this may be difficult for some of you to watch uh, because of where loved ones in your life are right now, maybe in advanced age, or you've had a parent or grandparent that's been there or, or maybe headed there, but hang, hang in there. I think, I think you'll be encouraged. I used music because when speech is gone, music, especially with Gladys Wilson, it was religious music because there's emotion tied to it and safety tied to it. So I used her old church song. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. What I did was, when she moved, I moved with her. And when I was singing, because she didn't sing with me, so I matched the intensity of my voice to the intensity of her movement. And pretty soon, for a split second, we became one person. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So at one point, when she got very quiet and very peaceful, and my voice became very quiet as hers and very peaceful, and my breathing slowed to her breathing, she pulled me to her, and I moved with her. And for her, at that moment, I believe I was a symbol of, of her mom. Feel safe and warm? Yeah? Can you sing with me? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the whole world in his head. He's 
The breakthrough doesn't happen every time. The person will not always look their, open their eyes and look at you. But if you keep trying and you send, keep centering yourself and uh, really look at that person and really mirror their movements, maybe not this time, but the next time you come, you'll have a communication. You'll say it with Jesus yeah. and me. That's how deeply in our hearts these songs of faith are, are planted and buried. And we'll take these songs to eternity with us. And we're going to know a lot fewer songs there uh, than those we don't know. So get used to learning new songs because this has been going on for a long while, and we've just been around here a short time. That's why we sing to those uh, who can no longer speak. That's why we sing to those who are in that transition from this world to the next, because they can hear and those it's messages from those songs. Encourage their hearts. Robert, we'll just skip, skip to the end. Um, lead, come lead us about God being our, our song have needs that need to be expressed uh, and, and shared. If, if you want to have the kind of faith in, in your heart that Gladys had in hers, and hope the salvation that she had in her heart, if you want to put Jesus on in baptism this morning, we would love to assist you with that. Let's be standing and singing.